Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of World of Sumo Presents Inside the Doyo. This is part two of our exclusive interview that me and John Trail, my co-host, had with Minami Noshima, ex Sukibito to Yokozuna Misashi Maru. Enjoy. Bye. So who were the um, un- untouchables back in the days of the scandal? I think you said Takano Hano had a reputation for not... Um, they're not getting into any nonsense. Is that is that correct recollection? And um, people, somebody said the other day, oh, I stopped watching Sumo after <clears throat> Takanohana let his brother Wakanohana win. But whether or not that happened, I mean, Wakanohana had to win because he wanted to retire. <laughs> but um, what was your recollection at the time of uh, sort of who was beyond reproach? Well, I think it's, um, I think it's not that. I think probably Wakanda Hana wanted to win so badly that you know just because he wanted to tie it, uh, retire, you know, to retire yeah. with a loss. I think probably you know it's not a, a good outcome. But to retire with a win, it's, it's sort of a, you know, it's a different story and it's a good it's a good retirement. Mm. But on the other hand, for Wakanda Hana to give up, for what I know about him, he doesn't give up easily to anyone. So. I don't think yeah. um, that actually, you know, I think that he came up. And also just by giving up because Bobby, you know, he, they both train together. They both know each other. They both know how to technique. Bobby Wakat Nohana got a, you know, got a, a two, two step forward and get on him. That's how he able to beat him. So it's sort of a mind game as well. No, just not just physical, but also mind as well. I, I think that I definitely think that that was that the um, what you were saying there about how they know each other definitely would have played a huge part when when they faced each other, um, because obviously back then in all Takanohana there was a there was a lot of guys up in the the top ranks with him, so it was more so Aki Bono that had the, and Masashi Maru that had to constantly fight all of them at the same time in that. But um, I dare say in the stable, none of us really know how well Takanohana done on a regular basis to the other guys, maybe done as well as a lot of people would think, but these guys obviously had plenty of time to figure him out, and then there is the whole older brother hanging in that rivalry, so um, I, I don't I don't want to believe that that was any, played any part in that, in anything that they, any interactions they had in the dojo. I'd like to think that that was just straight and Wakanohana won that one because, but I'm I'm a bit biased there and all because Wakanohana happens to be like one of my he's one of my favourite Rikishis ever. So, you know what I mean? Uh, I think I'm being a wee bit biased on that one and all. Yeah, and I think it's also come with you know with getting prepared and the, hmm. the effort that that he puts into it. Because um, from my experience working for um, Yakosuna Mushashimaru is that um, I noticed when he. When he's about to 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 wrestle a person that you know a rival of, of his own, um, for what I notice about him, he'll train more, he'll train a lot, and he'll spend more time thinking about it. Because I, I think it's it's you know you have to put everything into it in order for you to win it. You can't just you know you can't just do. You know, just do a normal training and then expect to win. Or, you know, you just say because you keep winning all the tournament, you think you're going to win it again. But it's not. For what I see is, for what I noticed from the Yokozuna is, is that, especially when it comes to them versus Oseki or, you know, versus uh, mm-hmm. versus another Yokozuna is that they, they train a bit more harder than usual as always. Uh, and then obviously that is the... That is the sort of mentality that has elevated them to, to that position. You know what I mean? That that mentality you always want to be the best and do better and, and being able to mot- motivate yourself at the most important times as well to to find the drive. So Masashi Maro, how is how is being you know what I mean, like like serving under him and travelling with him and you know what I mean? Like how is that as a just an overall experience? Did it did it like open your eyes? To the world more obviously because you were you're for, you're for Tonga, so it must have been a a, a life changing thing. To you. Not that you just went to Japan to become a rikishi, but when you when you finally got upgraded to to be travelling about with him, you know what I mean? And how how was that as an experience overall? 
uh, it was a good experience. Um, and also, on the other hand, it was a bad experience. Um, <laughs> the, good, the good experience was um, I get to go around with him a lot. I get to go hang out because um, Mushas Malu, he's um, half this, you know, he's Tongan um, Samoan. So, you know, where he goes or when we have a Tongan uh, function, he used to take me there and things like that. So it was good. It was fun. So we get to go hang out and go eat good food. The problem I had to face was um, in the Japanese culture, I can't do that. Just because uh, due to him being a Yokozuna, I can't, you know, I can't just, um, you know, just mingle along with him. Uh, for where he sits on the table, I have to go and sit in a different table. Or mm -hmm. where he eats, I have to, you know, I had to wait until he finished eat and then, you know, then I eat. But because of me hanging around with him and him being, you know, being a Tongan and uh, Islander, you know, us, we like to share food and eat at the same time and share what we do. So he's doing it, you know, because he knows that that's what we do. And then, you know, he tell me to do it and I can't say no. But when I do it, I know that I'm going to face the Ch Japanese and the other Rikishi when I go back to the stage because they see me eating with him or like do what I do with him, which I'm not supposed to do. So that's the problem that I had to face because I always stuck between that. Should I say no? to him or say yes because I can't say no to him because he's a Yokosuna so he tell me to do it so I had to do it but on the other hand the, you know the Rikishi the Japanese Rikishi told me that I can't do it because he's a Yokosuna so it was a problem that I had to face every time that I had to go out with him just because of that so you were burnt either way no matter what you done you were burnt <laughs> <laughs> and there was some, there was some times like I just go like you know what I'm just gonna enjoy it if they you know if I get punished afterward I'll let them punish me but you know <laughs> I just Aye. go I barely ask for forgiveness and permission so mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that, that you know that takes me out and make me sneak out the window because of that I get to <laughs> enjoy too much at some point, you know, that I started to. You know, not to worry about the punishment that I'm going to get afterwards. I'm just going to have to go and enjoy it. Right. So I think that was that was one of the bad things that I, I regret doing was that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I love that you were um, sneaking out and enjoying a double life because it really is um, like a lot of people just judge everyone so harshly. And uh, there are a lot of scandals that happen. There's actually one... Um, one of the websites, Touchy Eye, has a, a scandal meter. They go, oh, it's been 32 days. Well, actually, never gets more than 32 days with a, since the last scandal, <laughs> very often. <laughs> but um, why do you think there's so many scandals? <laughs> it's not always the foreigners, that's for sure. But uh, why, why do you think that happens? It's kind of like the rugby league that always happens. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think why, it's... Why, uh... I think one of the things is that um, you know they they recruit us to to the stable like in a young age you know we go in there like 14 15 16 and what I what for my experience that we miss out you know that teenage years you know from 14 to like 20 or 21 you know if you live outside the stable you pretty much you know go hang out with your friends go karaoke go night clubbing and things like that but you know you go into the, the sumo stable there's nothing like that you had to train 24 7 monday to sunday and then the only time you get to have a break is after tournament you, you get a one week off and that one week off is not really much a one week off. You have you still have to do training, or you have you, you got to do the cleaning, or you gotta um, you gotta do what the you know the older boys or you know the Anitesh is telling you to do. So I think that's that's what sort of you know push some other boys, some other rookies to go out and and do this kind of thing because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they miss out and they you know they needed to just feel what it's feel like to do to do that so you reckon they should um like what, what, <clears throat> once they reach a certain stage they're they're obeying the 11th commandment i shall not get caught <laughs> and <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I sneak out the window <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. and uh, the thing that i used to sneak out because um 
our rules was like if it go beyond two kilometers away from the stable, you have to wear your kimono or your kata <laughs> or you know things like that. Okay. But for me, like you know, if we go on like that, I know you get the attention. You know, you know some people they love the attention when you wear the kimono and the yukata, you get showing up as a rikishi. But for me, I like to hide it. That's why I always sneak out. Just if I walk out the door, you know, with my if I walk out in the front, in the front door, just the camera is there. You know, they'll see me walking out with my shorts and my t-shirt. So I always sneak out on the window with my beanie on to cover my hair, and then I have shorts and a t-shirt, and I get out. Of here. But I think it's if if they care a bit more, I think they they're just being strict on the on the rikishi. If they keep more, uh, what do you call it? Uh, shit, more freedom, a, long, a longer leash. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah if, if if they give them, but like just just give them like warnings and head ups of uh, you know things that could happen if, if they go beyond that. I think probably that's the thing, you know, that they, that they it might gonna help a little bit because by stopping them and you know try to force them, uh, sometimes. You know, it made them feel like they want to do it more. So, <laughs> just for my experience for myself, like when they try to stop me and forcing me to, you know, <clears throat> try to make me stay in the stable for, for the whole week, you know, it even made me like it made me feel <laughs> like wanted to sneak out more just because of that. But if they just, <laughs> you know, give the freedom and let them go out and things like that, but remind them not to do those those stupid things, so we should be all right. Oh, what advice do you have for amateur sumo competitors? The you've been in um, pro sumo and you've done you won a couple of uh, amateur sumo competitions. Do you have any advice for for us as, as sumo gets more popular around the, the world? Um, we want to know whether it's going in the right direction. Like it's uh, we think. Um, it's sort of sacrilegious to copy pro sumo because it's it's not part of amateur sumo and we haven't earned the right or understanding a lot of people don't understand exactly why so what um what advice do you have for us uh, trying to compete in amateur sumo as a sport i think that um the one thing that i sort of see from the amateur because I competed in amateur as well before I went into the uh, professional and what I found out is that um, because in the amateur we have the the weight divisions we have the lightweight the middleweight and the heavyweight and then going into into pro there's no such thing as you know weight divisions it's all open up but it just depends on your winnings so what I found out by doing that is that um, I think in the amateur, our mind is sort of set into, you know, let's say if you're lightweight, you know, your mind will set that you will only wrestle, you know, guys in your weight divisions, you know, in that thing, which is going to minimize the, you know, the skills and authority in the mind that you will be able to beat someone that's bigger than you. So, which is come to the team players when I know what happened in the team players, it, it doesn't go with the weight division. It just go with, you know, who goes first, second and last, isn't it? And the amateur? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I think that's that's when the professionals are sort of coming in to the amateur set. It doesn't matter who is going to face um, uh, as long as you're ready for it. But what I reckon that, you know, everyone should try to know, as long as you have your balance, your skills and your technique right, it doesn't matter what what weight division is you going to be on. It's you know, it doesn't matter if you're going to wrestle a uh, you know 200 kilo guy or 180, mm. you know 150, or double your weight. If you got all this free, it doesn't matter. You know, you'll be easier to wrestle. And pretty much on the other hand, you know, you might think that it'll be hard for you to wrestle, you know, a bigger guy than you. But on the other hand, for what I what I noticed that it will be much more harder for that big person to wrestle a smaller guy. Yeah, so, yeah. If, yeah, if everyone knows that, you know, it'll be much easier. You know, sometimes we get into the ring, in the amateur, we get scared. We're worried about, oh, he's too big, I can't beat him. 
But, you know, to be honest, you know, professional skills, like, you know, it doesn't matter what your size, it's more like what your skills, like. Yeah, I think you're like me. I prefer to go against someone, the bigger the better, because you know what to expect. <laughs> yeah. So see, in, um, in the lower divisions, do you guys develop rivalries between each other in the lower divisions, or is it all just to concentrating on trying to go up the ranks and that, and nothing really develops? Like, see, we spend a long time in the lower divisions. Do you guys get these sort of rivalries built up? Yeah, does uh, everybody change too much to be able to fight the same people twice? I noticed your um, rap sheet, you, there are people you've only ever fought once before. And, yeah, not many that you fought on a regular yeah, I think basis. The only... Uh, the only rivals that I had was when I get into uh, the top uh, Sandami and the Makushas. That's that's where pretty much most uh, Rikishi or a lot of the Rikishi you know spend most of the time is between those the Sandami and the Makusha before going into sectory. But uh, yeah, I I think if it was day long, I think I was there for two years. So I started to get a get some rivals and you know no other players and things like that um, on that so yeah it's actually, we do have it there so do you, um when you join sumo it's a real leap leap of faith do you think that new recruits actually like sumo uh, like doing it are they enthusiasts or are they attracted to perhaps the shiny lights and um the promise of fame and fortune that the top of the pyramid, even though they know that the chances of uh, breaking into the uh, top division is very slim. So for some of them, it's really a, an indentured lifestyle rather than um, uh, a proper living where you get a salary from it. So what, um, what do you think their thoughts are when most new recruits join? Are they just shit scared and <laughs> go ahead and do what they're told or are they actually um, got thoughts of becoming rich and famous and successful. I think um, that's a good thing about uh, the Japanese Rikishi because um, you know they have sumo even from primary school. They already learn it from there, and you know it's it's uh, what do you call it. They know the stories and the history, and they you know their parents have been watching it, so they sort of had a mindset, and you know and the knowledge of what they want to become. You know, they, they want to be a Makuchi or want to be a Yokozuna, things like that. But what I, what I see is that from us, from overseas, looking at it and joining Sumo is a bit different because, uh, you know, some sports, Mongolia is different because they have Sumo there as well. So it's pretty much a bit similar for them. But for myself, when I joined in, I. I didn't really know much about Sumo. My dad didn't talk much about it. The only thing I know is that, um, yeah, you were able to have a certain, you know, you would get to earn some money when you get to the top ranks. And uh, for one of the reasons why I was joining in there, because I was thinking that, you know, I was able to um, to help out with my families and with my brothers. There was eight of us and my parents. So I was thinking, oh, yeah, am I going to join in and see if I if I'll get better, then I'll help them out. Um, back to the islands so I did help out uh, a bit when I was there so um, for me that was the one of the reasons why I went in there but to have a more vision of what to become and to be on top I I didn't get that that view before I went in and some of the things that I, I see some of the Shindeshi that came in after me that I came into the stable there were some that being just shoved into the stable just because they were being um, troublemakers or, you know, they've they mm. they, they wasn't good at school or uh, their parents or they're always having trouble with him. So, so they put them into, you know, sumo staples because um, what I thought that they were thinking of putting them to the staples that they might be um, trained better and, you know, to be trained with the respect because what I know at Sumo Staples like uh, the Japanese culture there is really strong you know the the honor and the respect so what I see is that some of the young guys they were sending to the Sumo Staples 
uh, one of the reasons why they're saying it just because of that, just to train them to have that honor and respect. And they did, they did learn that. And um, I faced some young kids who come in with no, no respect at all, but it turned out that they were doing really great afterward. And some of them uh, actually, um, I think probably they didn't know of any other life but doing similar. And some of them was like, they were already targeted to hit the top ranks and, you know, they've been doing similar from young age and they're really good at it. Uh, so I think it just depends on the individuals when they come in. Yeah, I think Takanohana probably made a mistake when he recruited from the uh, juvenile detention centre. <laughs> he unfortunately had made a few bad choices with uh, people who needed a bit of anger management, didn't he? <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. because what I what I see in in things like that is that they um, they sort of uh, think that you know kids from uh, having those kind of backgrounds is that they have the they what they call the the hungry session or you know the cuts inside that you know you want to keep fighting for it until you get it which is good you know inside the ring but the problem there's another thing so you know some other things that come along with it was which uh, i think that's what happened to tangan nohana just you know they they were probably good inside the ring but there were some other things outside that actually come along with it that made it hard for them to deal with it how, how um, scary are the Oyokata? That's one thing that really struck <coughs> me when um, Ozumo came to uh, Australia. The, uh, uh, they, they came to the Gold Coast, Sydney and Brisbane. It was organised by a good friend of mine, Greg Lund. And I got to um, get quite close and uh, have, have lunch and um, dinner with them. And I was really surprised at how scared even the top rikshi were of their oyokata. So how scary were the oyokata to you on a, on a daily basis? I think it's, um, uh, to be honest, I wasn't scared of the oyokata. It's just that, uh, you know, the. I think it's more like a, a respect sort of thing. Uh, just because... Um, uh, just for the senpai gohai um, in Japan and in the culture as well, uh, which you have to respect the elders or you know, the older players. So I think that's that's what came down because even though some of the the top ranks are not stable, but they were still respecting the oyakata. Even the Yokosuna Shashimaru, even they, you know, he went to Yokosuna, but. Uh, when the Aoyakata talked to him, he still respected him and, and do what he, he, he was told to do. So for myself, I, I don't really think it's a scary thing. It's more like a, you know, more like a respect and honor uh, sort okay. of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that some of them, perhaps I was the one scared. They seemed, some Aoyakata seemed so grumpy. Like there were some days where Chiyo Fuji was very, welcoming and friendly to me and invite me in to the stable. Other days he had been, you could just tell that he was, uh, it's best to stay away. He was a bit grumpy, had a lot on his mind. There's a lot of um, pressure. They're running basically a business, a family, a stable. A, um, and they're, they're part of the, uh, um, the bigger organization. So obviously there's a, a lot of stress and uh, a lot of them have a bit of blunt trauma. Yeah, they're, over the yeah they're, they're really good. It's only it's only the time that they're stressing out or things like that, that, you know, they have to focus and, and do their own thing. And they they need that space, you know, when they think so. Um, I sort of see that myself. It's sometimes they're good and sometimes when they're stressing out their things, you know, it turns out to be totally the opposite of what they normally used to be. Because um, mm -hmm. I know my Oyakata to be really nice most of the time, and then there's sometimes that you know he's, you can tell that he's stressing out and worrying, especially when, when like because when I went in, we had free Oseki and the Yokozuna. So yeah, when I went in, when I, the first time I noticed when keep losing and things like that, I I noticed that I was a bit worried, and then he even pushed us to start early. Normally we started. 
uh, we normally start at six in the morning, and then he push us push us up to start at five, and then he even wow. told the the high rikishi to normally to come here around seven or eight. He told them to come at six as well. So, so yeah, I think that's when it comes to when they stress out, they sort of do it. But when they told everyone, it's pretty much I reckon it's the respect. You know what they, what we're being told is we have to do it. He's the master, and we respect that. Well, are there any real bastards that stand out? <laughs> you can't really name names, but somebody that you just had to avoid at all costs. Uh, for the Oyakata? Oh, oh, also the other Vixi, like your senpai as well, the um, the higher rank officers. Um, were there any that really uh, yeah the, there was some uh there was some rikishi in in my step with Francesco but I, uh, i'm not sure if you know if they're just trying to make me you know they push me to be stronger and better but there was some times that i think that you know are these rikishi being racist or you know are they trying to get on my nerves or things like that but yeah i, I faced a, a few of them in the in the in the summer world and I didn't really bother for what I for what I keep telling myself, just ignore them and move on. So pretty much that's what I do. And I noticed that, you know, they'll it's like they have their eyes on me twenty four seven, you know, for things that I've done and and what I do. So it pretty much there there are some bad ones out there. <laughs> So what would what would you say that there is the most unpleasant aspect of a sumo life for you? Normally, it happens on training. Um, you know, when when we start, when we losing a few games, and that you know the the Oyakata will get harsh on us. You know, because mm -hmm. he wanted us to keep winning and things like that. Uh, the only thing that I didn't enjoy while I was doing there was only there was only this one time that. Um, we went to a we went to a party and then and then um, so one of our top rikishi uh, I think he was singing or doing something on the stage and then um, when he finished I think we didn't clap or we didn't uh, we didn't join in or what what happened because I was I was distracted with some of my guests on the table that I was sitting with anyway so when we went back to the stable we we were all punished because we were not joining in the clapping or things. That's what I that's what I heard. So we had like man, they gave us a full swack in the butt and it was all bruises and things like that. And that was the only one time that I, I knew that, you know, well I don't know why they did that and that was the shittest thing I ever I ever had inside wow. the you know, being a rikishi. It was just a nonsense act. <laughs> I, I don't know whether I've told you this, Minami, but um, I, when I get in trouble with the International Sumo Federation, I'm quite proud of it because I get berated in Japanese. And I have to just um, sort of bow my head and say sorry and that. But last time it was because um, it was Saito-san who was the, the first world champion at the first world championships. <laughs> I got in trouble because I didn't know that Jenna, uh, who you trained as well, was behind me and she'd taken her, her top off and was just wearing a, um, a sort of sports top. I mean, she was still still respectable in that, but she was showing her stomach. So I didn't realise that you have to we have to line up in what we're about to fight in. And, I got in big trouble for that, but I didn't notice it happened. It was like about 35 degrees in the stadium. So I'm always kind of, I know it's hard for you to put up with um, yeah, when you get in trouble every day, but for me, I'm kind of proud when I get, um, get in trouble in Japanese. <laughs> I can just sort of bow my head and you know, show, show that I'm sorry. Yeah, so, and I think, it, you know, you get to find, you know, a similar person you know, everywhere you go, doesn't matter if it's in Japan or, you know, your own country or back in Tonga, it's like you, you always get to find that one person who always try to get in the nose and they will always try to, you know, to find that even that small mistake you do, they'll try to bring it out as, make it as the worst thing you ever done. 
<laughs> and but as long as you put on this ad price, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So you know how we were just you just mentioned like one of the, one of the worst moments for you. Um there we were talking about the unpleasantness and sumo. So see we flip that and say what was what was your best experiences in sumo or what was the best part about being a sumo tori? Um uh, it was just I think it's just my whole life. Um I think that's the best thing that I for for my experience at the moment, everything that happens to me while I was being uh, a Rikish is that it all made me who I am mm -hmm. right now. Um, even the good times and the bad times, you know, even though during when I was doing it, you know, I felt bad and, you know, I feel sick of it. But mm -hmm. for what I learned from it, and, you know, being who I am at the moment, I can, you know, it's, it's a very good experience that I learned to, to be able to handle, you know, handle harsh things like that. Because it's, it's sort of, um, I sort of put everything that I learned being a Rikishi and I put it into my life at the moment as well. It's, I try to, you know, you know the, the real world is really harsh. And mm -hmm. what I learned from there is pretty much just the same outside. You know, when you come outside, it, it's harsh. It, maybe not physically, but also mental and things like that. You just get yourself ready to it. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and plus, I learned the Japanese culture. That's one thing I, I, I was really happy that I get to learn the Japanese culture. Is I I respect that culture. Um, we have our own Tongan culture as well. It's a bit similar to that, but the Japanese one it's it's more tougher than our one. So I I was really happy to learn it and you know able to know about it. And also to you know to taste the Japanese food and the dishes, uh, the Japanese dishes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing happy that I get to learn and to know about it. Because when we're at the stable, we're not allowed to eat junk food. We're not allowed to eat McDonald's or KFC and things like that. So we we're punished for that. Because if you're able to eat junk food, then you're able to eat more at the stable. So we should. Back then, I was going like, I wanted to have McDonald's, but I can't. And I was pissed, you know, I was pissed because of that. But what I see now is that it was a it was a good thing that they actually did and, and stopped me from doing it. Yeah, I think that's an important point that you brought up, that the diet is very healthy. A lot of them, um, well, in particular, there's one country that lives on junk food that try to, well, they think that that's how it actually get big. And it's just not. True, it's a very healthy diet, isn't it? It is. It is. It's just the uh, the only thing that made made the rikishi bigger is just because they keep pushing us to eat. But <clears throat> the food that they made us eat is very healthy. Um, it's very. They have to take out the fat, scoop out the fat from the pot and things like that. So, pretty much healthy. We're not allowed to eat the you know the chips from the stores or things like that, or snacks and. Anything. They say, like, if you're able to eat those kind of junk food, then you're able to eat more, you know, more bowls of rice. So, yeah, pretty much what we fed with is, is carbs and, you know, protein and things like that. So our body was built from that, but not from, you know, junk food and things like that. How different is the Tongan diet? Because I, uh, I remember the Tongan. you were saying... Saying that natto, you, you didn't, you thought natto tasted like crap, <laughs> but you ate it. And um, but yeah, you, the Tongan diet, uh, you have a lot of fresh fish, but you cook it. Is that the main thing? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of fresh fish and uh, and uh, roasted pig. Both those, those are the you know main dishes we have. And, uh, and coconuts, yeah, coconuts, the the white stuff on the coconut, we eat it when it's still green, so that's one of the protein that we get from the coconut. <laughs> and and the natto, first time when I when I had the natto was it was disgusting. I I I threw up when the, the first time I ate it, but it, it went to a point that I love it. I love natto. I keep scooping out with the. Mm -hmm. With the onsen tamako, with the you know the onsen eggs, and keep scrambling the other board on the rice. It went to a point that I love it. So uh, I, 
<laughs> yeah, I think it just needs to keep trying them more times, and you know, to get get the body used to it. Do you think Tonga can get back into um, back to their former glory? I know um, it died off a bit when um, Naoko, who'd married one of the um, Tongan Sumotori, and she passed away, then there was a, a Japanese coach that came over to Tonga and um, he stayed there for a year and wasn't really a good fit for uh, the happy um, <laughs> happy people in Tonga because he was a bit strict and they, he took away the enjoyment and he wouldn't let them laugh during training or talk and he was applying his um, Japanese principles to um, to the training and that was one thing that I learned it's really important to um, try to emulate the Japanese way as much as possible but it's amateur sumo it's not pro sumo so there's no fun in being um, having kawaii gari or if people don't understand why you're doing that they just think you're being uh, grumpy but yeah the Tongan kids obviously came along uh, bringing a lot of laughter to training and uh, I think, I mean, what's the forest without the birds? So, um, what do you think about the future of sumo and Tonga? Um, the, the only problem that we have in Tonga is that we need someone that actually, you know, know how to run it. Um, it was good that we had the help from Japan, the coach to go there. Um, I think on that time, the only problem there was because my dad was busy with his work. But if he wasn't busy, if he will be there, it will be all right. It's just because, um, you know, um, countries are different. Uh, for, yeah, for what I know is that uh, he went, like what you said, he went and did the things that, you know, we pretty much see that as, as normal in Japan for, for a coach to do that in Japan. But to go to other countries and do that there, it's totally, you know, you can't do that, <laughs> you know, it's, um, especially to a country that doesn't know about your culture, the Japanese culture. And plus, you know, you're working with kids, you know, kids are, are different. You have to make them to enjoy the game. Um, I think you get to a point that, you know, being mature enough to understand the game and things like that, then you can enforce those kind of things. But for for them working with kids they need to make the kids enjoy and love the sports you know that's the thing about sports yeah. you have to enjoy and have fun about it in order to do it but if you go straight straight away from the beginning um you know in Tonga like there's other there's heaps of other sports you know that you know kids can get to but if they enforce it and try to be tough like that on the on day one um you know kids will turn around and go to the other sports and then we have it there but um yeah, the only thing, don't know if anyone, like for myself, if I ever get to go back to Tonga someday and live there, then I won't be able to run it again over there. It's just that they need someone or like a, a, some, a person that actually understands the Tongan culture and the Tongan life, uh, way of life out there and to mix it along with the Japanese culture to be able to run the sumo at, at, over there. Otherwise, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be totally hard for recruiting that even the kids to understand what's going on over there. Hey, you're not allowed to go back to Tonga. <laughs> 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 we need you. We want you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much I love it here. It's just that, you know, I had enough of traveling when I was in Japan, so pretty much I've settled here for for the time being. But yeah, if I if there's ever a chance that I might gonna retire or something like that, then yeah, I might gonna end up going back to Tonga and retire there. Now, Tonga is a good country to retire, you know, you nothing to worry, no bills, no rent, <laughs> no tax. Oh, so that's all we'll come with you. And then to survive <laughs> from the from the seafood and all the you know, all the crops and then you grow. So yeah, I think it's it's good for retirement, but yeah, for working when you're still strong enough to work, I prefer just living here and work. So, Minami, let me ask you this. Um, you obviously served under Musashi Maru for a, a good time. Um, see, obviously, Yokozuna get hundreds of spoils and wins and gifts and all sorts. So do a lot of Rikishi in stables. Um, did did you get to share in any of these spoils? Did you get any wee extras? Like, or did he get any, like, 
off the wall gifts, you no know, weird things or something that you can share with? I th- I think I have I have heaps, and you know there are some things that I want to share with you, like <laughs> 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 like you know when we go when the uh, when we're going out with the escorts and things like that, you know, when, when we get out for dinner with his uh, with his sponsors and them, you know, they, they will bring uh, they will bring girls to come and you know take along, and not just for for the Yokozuna himself, but you know they will give one for me as well to just to enjoy the you know the you know things like that, which is cool and I sort of love it. You know, we get out, they give also when they give out money because when we get out. You know, the Tanimachi will give us some, you know, cash in hand just to, you know, just to enjoy it and go spend it on the night. So, yeah, it's, it's really good. I, I enjoy it most of the time when I hang around with him. Did you so, have many groupies? Right, you that's, that's what I was just about to ask as well there. Like, do you, how did how did you, like, meet women outside of that situation and then the groupies thing? That's a great question. Uh, it was pretty much just to go um, just get to know and have friends and things like that, hang out and that's it after that and just get home and then also they um they say you get some more fans and um yeah more girls um girls fans <laughs> in the crowd mm-hmm. just go hanging out on dinner and some some other times after the tournament they call up they, they wanted to go out with them it's just that they you know they sort of saying that they love the smell of being of the rikishi and the Sumotoli, so yeah, it was a, that's a good thing just to get friends and hang out with them. Is that um, like, are there any sort of um, evil forces that are there trying to lead Lurikshi astray, like um, the journalist and Asano Yama, and you know, some of them get, um, get in a bit of trouble um, if they can't keep it in their Mawashi? So, are there, were there many temptations like that? I know. Um, Often some professional sports people they get picked on in bars, and maybe that happened to us, Shorty, or well, maybe not. But um, were there any sort of? Did you feel as if there were evil forces leading you astray, or, or do some of the um, the higher rank uh, ever have to contend with that? Yes, it did. Um, it's funny because yeah, I've seen a few. Um... I seen a few girls who coming up to the you know, to the stable and you know um, coming out with the babies, you know, telling the other Rikishi or whoever they're coming to, yeah, you gotta sign this, we gotta get married, or you know, they have they have a child or something like that, and you know, things like that. I think it happens in every every sports. Um, I I fall into it myself. I get to a point that you know I start missing out, you know, going out with girls and things like that, which has got me off guard and you could enjoy it, but um, yeah, yeah, that's the evil force about it. You just need to, I think it's more like just need to understand and um, what to call it. If if there's anyone there, like a good advice is to just to advise the Rikishi team, you know, even though they can still go out, but to manage it properly. So um, it's more like a parent, a parental thing, you know, sort of give them direction of, uh, and just a head up of what's going on so that they know what they're doing even if they go out they're still able to maintain and stay on the line and then you know go back and do all the training this is what happened there when you know because they've been there for from young age and when they get to go out it's pretty much they go out wild and <laughs> they don't know what's happening and that's what that's the outcome of it you know someone will come in and bang and we had to uh, when I was there, the, I think they had to call the police to, you know, to escort uh, a lady out from the stable because she keeps coming and she even walked, came into the stable with a with a golf uh, golf club and keep banging on the wall and the fences. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, it happens sports, but it's just that, yeah, if there was a, a like an advisor or, you know, someone, to be there to, to you know for the young kids to talk to them and to you know tell them what's happening and to direct them you will know, be much better right uh, and i that suppose me... oh sorry we done again on you go john sorry. oh sorry that before i forget that just reminds me of the story you told us about takami sakari the reason i bring it up is because he had, a, had to escort a crazy woman off the dojo but can you tell us a story uh, 
about um, how I was saying that Takama Sakari uh, was very weak in uh, training, but very strong in the dive. Well, that was, uh, um, I love the way you linked it back to the Tongan expression. Can you take us through that one? Yeah, because, uh, you know, I've, I've seen a few people like that, you know, throughout my life, even from young age, is that, you know, when you, even when we do um, rugby back in Tonga, you know, from training, you know, they, they're so weak and things like that. But there are some certain things that, you know, when they put their, when they put their focus and their action into it, they made them, you know, two times stronger than what they used to be or even more than that. Because that's what I see in Takami Shakari, you know. For, <clears throat> for what I say is that I know most people say that he was weak in training. And, um, I did train with him a, a little bit and he wasn't weak. He was really strong. But to, I think they're talking about weak comparing him with the Makunochi um, level. So he's pretty much weak for the Makuchi, but, you know, to wrestle with the, with the lower level, he's, he's pretty much good. He's really good. And also, I think just by doing that in, in training, he, he doesn't really give much focus and attention and, you know, all his effort in, the, in, in training time. It's only that, you know, when tournament comes that he's fully on focus because he can see him in the changing room and, you know, every, every basho, every basho is that, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't talk or mingle with anyone else. He's pretty much just trained, focused, do what he, he do normally. And then that's it pretty much and ready to go inside to the door here. But outside of that, he, you know, like for training, so like that, he'll go talk to other people, talk to fans and, you know, and friends and things like that, which is, which that's what makes me understand, you know, what he's able to do, what he do, what he can do in the show is that when he put his focus in it, you know, like you said, he he get that he get that full strength <laughs> that he's <laughs> able to put it there because he got the focus and everything into it inside the show. What are some of the biggest myths and misconceptions <laughs> that people have about? Being a sumotori, I know whenever we do a demonstration, there's, there's one thing that you're very quick to point out. Um, things that you definitely didn't have to do, but a lot of people think you do. Remember that one, Minami, the, uh, <laughs> about going to helping helping out the uh, uh, the senior rikshi? You don't have to help them go to the toilet? Oh, no, no, no. Um... Yeah, we never do that in our stable, so <laughs> I think it just depends. I I heard some, you know, some other stable, some other, you know, uh, secretary used to do that to the, uh, to the security, but, uh, you know, it's not something that I've seen or uh, noticed or even did it myself. So pretty much, I didn't know what's happening there. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's one other thing <laughs> with the stretching and the things in Silver because when we go to the toilet, we can able to handle that ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good way of putting it. That's a good example. <laughs> it does come up. A lot of people think that you have to wipe arms and you have to um, scrub toilets. Well, you do have to probably yeah. scrub yeah, toilets. In, in the, like for, for, a, for a normal person, like, you know, in when we see outside in the world for someone being big the only there's some things that come to our mind that we're thinking how is that person you know going to be able to look after themselves when they get to the toilet but what they don't know is for for a sumo wrestler even though they are that big but they are very flexible you know they can turn like really backward they're really, they're like a uh, gymnastic, you know, they can stretch. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't, it's not even hard to, you know, to look after yourself when you get to the toilet. So, yeah. I can reach around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was just one other, one other funny thing that reminds me um, when I was there in Japan is that um, there was something about my bum that I always, you know, I had to have have a few trouble with it when I was in Japan. 
And because my bum was sort of, you know, shaped out, you know, rolling out, because I'm from the <laughs> island, so we sort of have a good bum there. <laughs> and what I know, that, you know, some Japanese, they have the flat bum. <laughs> and uh, my first experience of having it, well, I was I was on my way to, to the tournament one time and I was catching the train. And then next minute, I feel a I feel a palm on my palm. It was like just rubbing up and down smoothly, and I was I was shocked. You know, it was, who had done this? And I look around. I, I saw. I looked next to me. There was a lady standing there, and she was just rubbing my my, my ass. And then I thought that she would take off her hand, but it was just normal. And then she looked to me, and she goes like, "Oh, you got a nice ass." And that was it. And I go like, "Man." <laughs> And then there was another lady that came into the training and then after the training and she goes to me like, man, I, I wish I could have a, a child with you just to, you know, just for the child to have your, your bum. And I go like, my goodness, is that the only thing that they get to see was that? <laughs> I got, I got groped on a rush hour train once and I didn't know whether to enjoy it or not. I couldn't see who was doing it. No, it was a guy or a girl. <laughs> yeah, pretty much for what I noticed that you know you get to hear that you pretty much I know it's not good, but you hear men touching women. But my first experience was this, you know, this you know, this person was rubbing my ass and I look at her and she didn't even order, she was just keep rubbing it and I go like that girl. <laughs> what were you wearing? <laughs> I was wearing my Yukata, it was a, it was on summertime and you know, I had my just a normal uh, pants inside, and then like, you cut outside. So pretty much, uh, it was shaped out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, wee woman coughing a field, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, well, I mean, I mean, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out your day and and joining me and John and answering all these questions and. Um, it's been really interesting, honestly, and I've learned hundreds for you. Um, so I can't thank you enough for joining us, mate. I really appreciate it. No, it's, it's good, and I'm happy to you know, to give out my my opinion and my thoughts and things like that because I know there are a lot of people out there who doesn't really understand much about Subway and True. You know what other people need to look, you know have a look at it to. I know they're giving their view from outside, but they also need to have a view from the inside to, you know, in order to understand what's going on inside there. Right. Now, you know, it can be judgment just from one side of the story, but if they get mm -hmm. to see both sides of the story, then, you know, they can understand what's going on. Instead of being judgment, then they could enjoy it more about it. Right. Well, listen, um, we would be more than happy if, if any time you wanted to join us again or give your opinion on anything, you're welcome to, to come join me and John any time you want, mate. Just the, the, the invitation's always open to you. Uh, yeah. If you guys um, have another thing coming up next time, just you know, let me know and oh, yeah. we can uh, discuss it out and solve it out and see what we can help out with the with the fans out there you know it's good that everyone will get to understand and be on the you know on the same spot hey yeah we we could listen to your stories for hours some of them probably we should have had the record recording on but the um it's been an invaluable experience to actually yep well firstly you've got you've got scott and i who do know we are passionate about our sumo and um we're asking you that um questions that are oh how much do you guys eat how many bowls of rice do you have <laughs> and um uh yeah it's been well it's almost unprecedented to get such an insight in in uh, perfect english absolutely and um it's a lot of people might translate the uh, odd article from google but you just don't get the proper insights for example even some people have done books on the techniques of Kimarite, but they're just the same as Wikipedia. They're static mm -hmm. pictures, but you're actually like a, um, um, well, an, a, an expert on it. How, uh, how, well, like when I read, read those um, books that they, they don't tell you anything, how to actually get into the position, 
to be able to do the throws and to have you <laughs> as um, like our own personal um, technician is just unbelievable and that's helped us a lot in the, uh, the world championships because it's it's not just about looking at a book and becoming an expert it's about actually doing it and some, you show yeah yeah sometimes um, like when you read yeah. about it you don't know about it it's it, it's it's not easy to put it into action absolutely so it's a bit different when you put it into action that's good i think mm. um right well brilliant then uh, it's right well thanks very much again um thanks very much to you john for joining us um Minami no Shima, thank you very much again, my friend. It's been absolutely brilliant and insightful. Um, and I hope everybody enjoyed this wee look into the sumo world. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Yeah, bye.